Hello, Catholic Nacogdoches. It's uh, the evening of Corpus Christi, and today I gave a, a homily that I think will, will create some conversations in Nacogdoches. I think some people will be talking about it, and so I want to just record the homily so that as people are having these conversations, they can they can go back and perhaps reflect again on uh, on the homily itself, on the on the ideas, and really just hear it all from from the horse's mouth, from the, the pastor's mouth, um, and so. Uh, this is my, my Corpus Christi Sunday homily. Happy Corpus Christi. This is a, a particularly Catholic feast. The feast that we, we celebrate, the, the sacrament of the Eucharist. Christ's body and blood present in the Blessed Sacrament. Um, but also, let's all agree that this is a... It's, very, it's a different feast. Right? There's, there's something different about how we celebrate this feast and really what you encounter in any other Christian church out there. You know, at, at the end of this Mass, we're going to have a, a Eucharistic procession. You know, none of the other denominations out there, except for maybe the Anglicans or Episcopalians, uh, but they even call themselves Catholic lights, and so they kind of know that they're copying us. But you don't really see anywhere else something like a, a Eucharistic procession where, where people are going outside and, and, and walking around after a sacrament. You know, in the world you do see situations where perhaps people go on, on marches or they, they're, they're outside you know, doing something. But, you know, any protest that you see or a march or something of that sort, a parade even... Those are very different than what we are going to do with this Eucharistic procession. You see, any, any protest, any parade, it's really about the people who are in the protest or parade showing to everybody else something. Right? If, you're, if you're protesting something, you're there uh, you know, marching somewhere or, or you're standing out there to show everybody else that, that you're upset about this injustice. If it's a parade, it's a kind of showing of, hey, look, this is our organization, or this is our thing, or this is, you know, it's a kind of look at us moment. But this Eucharistic procession, it's, it's not for anybody that isn't in the procession. The procession is for us to be able to express our faith in our bodies. It's to be able to show God our love and devotion in our bodies as we process with him. And that's what's so unique about this feast. This is a particularly kind of material, body, bodily, physical feast that we're celebrating. You know, I mean, you can even look at the name. It's it, the, the body and blood of our Lord. It's a feast of the body and blood of Christ. And, you know, that's obviously in reference to, to the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, first off, it's a, it's a feast for a sacrament. Once again, the sacraments are are these, these external signs, these kind of bodily material things that we use by which God gives us his love and his grace and by which we can also express our love to God. And then of all of the seven sacraments, it's the feast of the Eucharist, right? Which, which is the body and blood of Christ. Once again, a very bodily thing. And it can be hard to understand, but but if, if we understand that for us as Catholics, we believe that the God created, that created our bodies is also the God that saved us, it all begins to start making sense, right? If our, if our God created us as human beings in our body, he's, he created the whole material world, well then it doesn't make sense that in, in salvation, he would just leave all of that behind or, or not expect us to also direct our bodies and to direct the material world back to him. That's, that's what the story of creation and the story of salvation is about. And so in this feast day, we really kind of see all of that coming together. And this God that, that created us as human beings, he wants to show his love to us and he wants us to show our love to him also through our bodies because that's just kind of how we were made. I think one thing that can help us to understand this well is the idea of the, the five love languages. If you haven't heard of the five love languages, um, it was this kind of concept that was developed uh, 
it started becoming popular about 30 years ago. Um, and the idea is that every human being uh, expresses and receives love in one of these five ways, or really every human being can, can receive and give love in, in all five of these ways. But each of us has you know, a particular way that we, we give love or that we receive love with, with more facility. It's just easy for, easier for us or we recognize it more easily. And so this is this kind of recognition of just how human beings work. And the five love languages, the first one is, uh, is acts of service, doing an action serving the other person in their body. The next one is, is quality time, so spending time physically together, right, in your body once again. There's another one, which is gift giving, and that's giving a, a material thing, a physical thing to the other person. And then uh, the fourth one is physical touch. So literally you know, touching body to body, you can think of, you know, a hug, a kiss, any other um, physical way to show love to the other person. And then the last one is words of affirmation. And so if you think about those five love languages, the five different ways that human beings receive love and communicate love, four of those five were really very bodily, very material things, right? Works of service, quality time, gift giving, physical touch. Those are all very much wrapped up in the material things. And it's only words of affirmation that is a little bit more immaterial. But let's be honest, to be able to, to hear words of affirmation or to be able to speak words of affirmation, you need a body, you need ears, you need a tongue. And so... God chose to give himself in love, in his body and blood, soul and divinity, in the sacrament, this material thing of the Eucharist. Because that's how we receive love. And he wants us to show us, or to, he wants us to show him his love, our love, so I'm getting all mixed up, to show him our love for him also in our bodies. And so hopefully it's all kind of coming together now in, in your minds. You're seeing it kind of click, this, this emphasis of, of the body for this God of love. So about a month ago, something kind of disconcerting happened. Um, we had uh, our, our confirmations and our first communions. That's, that's not disconcerting. That's actually a good thing. It was wonderful. We had about 80 kids across Nacogdoches, young people, um, receive the sacrament of communion for the first time and then also uh, the sacrament of confirmation. And that was a, you know, a, a wonderful time. We had uh, one confirmation here at Sacred Heart and then the other celebration was at Our Lady of Guadalupe. And this happened in both locations, but a total of four times that I noticed, and so I didn't even catch all of them, but there was a total of four times that one of these children, whenever we gave them the Eucharist, this great gift of love, God's presence among us, the child just walked off with the Eucharist, didn't even receive it. For us as Catholics, that should be kind of striking, un unsettling. You know, we believe that, that Jesus Christ is present in his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. We believe that it is fully God present there. And also we believe that in every, every particle of the Eucharist, Jesus Christ is fully present in his body, in his blood, in his soul, and in divinity. That if you can see it, then, you, then, that, then Jesus Christ is present there. And so when, it, when someone walks off with the Eucharist, the probability of them, of a particle kind of breaking off or dropping or something of that sort is, is just that much higher. And then it falls onto the ground and is just trampled underfoot. And so for us, it should be one of these, where, where, where are you going? And how in the world did this happen? You know, I, I know our catechists. We have good catechists. I know that they taught our young people that Jesus Christ is fully present, that that is God present there in the Blessed Sacrament. And I even know that the young people 
knew that. One of the things that we really are very strict on is that we, we interview every single one of the kids and we make sure that they know that's God. And if they don't know that, they don't get to receive First Communion. We just send them back. And so I know every single one of those kids knew that's God. And we practiced with every single one of the kids before they received communion for the first time. Okay, when you come up, you know, you receive this way. If you're receiving in the hand, you receive that. You know, you put your hands like this, and then you immediately put our Lord into your mouth. I know we did all of those things. But this child, and this was not one time, it was not two times, it was not three, it was four times. And it happened two times in each of the two churches. How is it that that happened? You know, I'm, I'm not angry at the kid. I don't really think it's the kid's fault, right? I mean, they, they knew the answers, they, they practiced, and they were just nervous. They were you know, freaking out because all this was new and different, and they didn't know what to do, and so they, they just kind of did whatever was almost instinctive to them or whatever was most natural to them. And they just walked off. But I think that is actually the problem. That, that what was most natural to our, our young people was not to receive our Lord and then, you know, whenever they're nervous, to think to themselves, oh my goodness, our Lord is right here. I need to treat him with such great reverence. I need to, to consume him with great love. But rather, just to kind of think to themselves, I'm going to walk away now. That's actually the problem. And so I kind of thought more and more about it, and I was thinking to myself, you know, from the point of view of, of a young person who uh, has been going to Mass you know, every single week since they were a baby, when they watch people receive communion, I don't know that really what's being expressed in the people's bodies is this great reverence, this great devotion, this great love that's being expressed in the body to our Lord. You know, I, I distribute communion, and so I see people's faces. And I have to admit that here in Nacogdoches, across all of our churches, we have faithful people. I see it in your eyes. The vast majority of you, you without a doubt believe. I'm going to really applaud you for that. That's excellent. But for... A child who's sitting in the pews, he can't see your faces. He just sees from behind. And so, what I want to do is I'm going to uh, task you all to try something out. And um, I'm, I'm sure this is going to kind of ruffle some feathers. Uh, but what I ask you all to do is just to, to listen just with a mind of faith just based on what we believe about the Eucharist and desiring to really love our Lord, show your devotion to our Lord in your body as well. You know, set aside whatever kind of church politics stuff you may have heard, set aside whatever habits you just may have developed over time um, and just really kind of listen. So, the first question that I have is, you know, if God were to appear before you, just boom, God right before you, what would be the, the normal bodily posture to take with God appearing right before you? Most of you are probably thinking, well, kneeling at the very least, if not actually just completely prostrate face to the ground. When we receive communion, we believe that God is present right there in front of us. And so I want to ask you to try out kneeling when you receive communion. Also, you know, not everybody else gets to see this, but for, for the deacons and for the priests, we, we purify the vessels. And I mean, I can tell you that when, when we put you know, more or less 100 hosts, that's a normal amount of hosts that we put into the ciborium, maybe 150. Um, 
after distributing communion, when we've emptied all of the hosts out, you look into that ciborium, that's in the ciborium is the, the gold container that holds the hosts for the Eucharist, the, yeah, the Eucharist. Um, you look in there, and there are usually about 25 particles of the hosts that are there in the bottom. And that's, that's why we purify those vessels every single time. Because we want to purify those, those particles out of the ciborium. And so, if in the ciborium, and remember, I mean, we don't really like shake the ciborium around or anything. Basically, the hosts get put into the ciborium and the sacristy gets put on a cart. The cart is rolled out. It's put onto the credence table and the altar servers move it from the credence table onto the altar. It's consecrated. And then from the altar, we go right down to distribute communion. So there's not a ton of movement that happens with this thing. And if for 100 hosts, we have 25 particles, then it's only reasonable that when we distribute 100 hosts, there are particles that fall. They fall off just onto people's hands by the transferring of the host. Or by picking it up and then putting it into your mouth. You know, you might have a particle on, a, on your fingers or on, on the palm of your hands or, you know, anywhere. And, you know, maybe sometimes people catch those particles and they consume them. But it would also be very reasonable that quite often a, a particle falls to the ground. And where does it probably fall? Well, somewhere in the aisles where everybody walks. And our Lord's body, blood, soul, and divinity, this gift of love in the Eucharist, is just trampled underfoot. So, in order to reduce the, the possibility or the probability of, of a particle falling onto the ground, um, I want to ask everybody to, to, to try uh, receiving on the tongue. Uh, you know, if you think about it, we have the, the, the patents, those are the gold plates uh, that, that the altar servers are holding. And so, really, with those gold plates, with the patents, when the priest picks up the host, uh, the patent is underneath the host all the way until it goes into your mouth. And so, really, there's no probability that a, a particle would fall to the ground um, with, with receiving on the tongue. Um, yeah, and so, I'm going to be very, very clear. I am not requiring this of anybody. I'm not telling anybody that they have to do this. Uh, you're absolutely free to receive communion, uh, standing or kneeling, on the hand or on the tongue. But what I am saying is that based on what we believe, the, the way that it just seems right to receive communion, if we want to express our love in our bodies to our Lord, is to receive kneeling and on the tongue. Now, I imagine there are a number of people who, who have some kind of objections to this idea. And so I just want to kind of list a few of them and, and give some responses to those objections. Uh, so the first one is, you know, Father, how in the world are you going to ask us to receive on the tongue during COVID tide? Um, so interestingly, over the past three weeks or so, there have been several articles published uh, that were written by... Catholic, you know, doctors and, and scientists and things of the sort who all kind of got together and said, hey, let's do some, some modeling, some testing. Let's look at, uh, you know, the numbers of COVID cases. <clears throat> Excuse me. And let's, uh, let's figure out what the, the safest way to receive communion really is based on, based on the science. Um, and what is fascinating is that they found that there is no correlation between people receiving on the tongue and uh, contraction of COVID that, you know, there, that's, that's not anywhere in the numbers. Also, with, with how we understand COVID to be transmitted, it's, it's not by a physical touch. You, you breathe in the droplets. It has to get into the lungs. And that's how uh, you catch COVID. And so whether the host is put into the person's hand or put into the person's mouth, it really, it, it, it doesn't change anything. Nothing yeah, you don't, you don't catch COVID by receiving on the tongue, is what basically the science has shown. Also, in regard to the, the posture, uh, the posture that is most COVID safe is actually kneeling. Because when one person is standing and one person is kneeling, then you aren't breathing into the same airspace. And so uh, you have a lower chance of contracting COVID in that way. And so, really, this way is, is the safer way to receive communion during COVID. 
also there may be some people that are thinking to themselves, Father, I can kneel, but I can't get back up. Um, you know, if that's the case for you, and, and I expect that to be the case actually for, for a decent number of people, that's no problem whatsoever. Remember, what we are doing is we are making an act of faith. It's an act of devotion, showing our love in our bodies. And so if this is actually going to be, you know, an absolute disaster in your body because you can't get back up or because you fall over or because, you know, whatever it may be, well then you just, I'm just asking you to show devotion and love in your body to our Lord. And if that means receiving standing because getting back up is going to be hard, then that's, that's perfectly fine. Do that. Just show the devotion and the love in your body that you can to our Lord. Um, yeah. Also, I just, I, I want to be super, super clear um, that the, I am not judging in any way anybody that, um, that, you know, has in the past received on the hand um, or is standing up or anything of that sort. Um, actually, in the uh, old, what's called the General Instruction to the Roman Missal, um, prior to 2011, it, it said that, that the norm was to receive standing um, and in the hand, and that priests should encourage the faithful to do that. Um, but in, in 2011, if you guys remember, there was the, the change in the translation, uh, the, the general instruction, which is the part of the, the Missal, and the Missal is the big red book that we use at Mass. Um, that part, uh, the, the, the general instruction that contains all of the, the rules, so to speak, uh, for Mass, uh, that part was changed a little bit as well, and that specific part was removed. Um, and it wasn't removed like on accident or they just forgot to copy and paste it. It was, it was removed intentionally because um, really the United States bishops can't restrict um, or can't tell people that they can't receive or shouldn't receive kneeling and on the tongue because actually kneeling and on the tongue is what's called the universal norm. So it's the, the norm for the entire world. It's from the Vatican. This is, this is how you receive communion. And it's really only if permission is given uh, to re sta receive standing or on the hand. Um, and so, you know, many of us, myself included, I grew up receiving uh, standing and on the hand because that's what I was taught. And really all the way up until 2011, you were just being obedient to your priest who was being obedient to the USCCB. But, uh, you know, in 2011, that was, that was removed um, because there was a real recognition that, no, uh, really the universal norm is to receive kneeling and on the tongue, and the USCCB can't uh, say anything against that. What it does say now is that um, the norm in the United States is to receive standing. But uh, the, the norm in that sense, uh, in, in the liturgy, is, is not norm in the sense of a law. It's norm in the sense of this is what is normally done. And so it's not telling us that we have to receive standing. It's just saying that in the United States, most people do this, which that is the case. Most people do receive standing in the United States. But, um, you know, I'm... I'm not sure that what is normally done is, is helping. Since this permission to receive, receive standing and in the hands was given in 1969, essentially there has been just a continual decline in Catholic mass attendance from then all the way until now. And even if there was a recent uh, study that was done that even among the people who are attending mass, only 30% of them believe that Jesus Christ is present in his body and blood, soul, and divinity. And so it seems that this, the way that we're receiving communion right now, it, it's not doing great things. I can at least say that much. So what I'm asking everybody to do is to, to try. Try out receiving kneeling and on the tongue. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's, it's awkward. At first, um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. You know, we all have our own the habits that we've just built over years and years of receiving communion. Um, you know, when you get in the communion line, sometimes you just kind of go into autopilot and, uh, 
yeah, you just you know, receive how you always have received. Um, but what, I'm, what I want to ask you is to receive kneeling and on the tongue until it just becomes natural, until it becomes a, a normal way, that, that the method itself is not difficult. Um, and it, it will eventually become normal. Uh, I myself, like I said, I grew up receiving standing and on the tongue. And it wasn't until actually my pastor, when I was in high school, gave a homily kind of similar to this one, that I just sat and I thought to myself, hmm, well, that makes sense. I guess I'll start receiving on the tongue now and kneeling. Um, and, I, and I started and it was really awkward the first several times, but after doing it several times, it just became natural. And when it became natural, then it just clicked in my mind. I was like, oh, this makes sense. And so what I want you to do is just to, to, to receive kneeling and on the tongue until it becomes natural. And then at that time, when really you're looking at, you know, two equal options, at least as far as your own habits go, then I want you to be able to make a truly free choice that wasn't just built up because, you know, this is what you were told to do in the past, or this is the habit that's been built up, but that you can just look at with the eyes of faith and you can say, which of these ways best expresses in my body the faith and the devotion that I have to our Lord in the Eucharist? And which of these two options expresses best in my body to the young people in our parish that I believe that the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. So that's more or less the homily that I gave. Um, every time I give a homily, there are some slight modifications, uh, but I wanted everybody to be able to hear that um, from me. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to, to talk through any of these things. Um, I, yeah, I genuinely just believe that this kind of a change will be very good for our community if, if the majority of people begin to receive kneeling and on the tongue. Um, I want to reiterate, you know, I'm not judging anybody that chooses not to do that, um, but I am asking you to simply look at it through the eyes of faith, what we believe about the Eucharist, and then uh, reason and say, well, what, what is the most reasonable way uh, to, to receive our Lord so that I can really express in my body, my love for our Lord, uh, specifically in the sacrament of the Eucharist, in which he gives his body to me in love. God bless.